Now, a nice analogy is in the world of biology and medicine. And many of you have probably heard of something called genomes and the idea that all diseases, you know, hopefully at some point in time will all be narrowed down to genetic defects. And if we can fix these genes, we can fix the problem. All right? And what the biologists are finding out is they don't have a genetic problem. They have a genetic puzzle. You may have even seen a report just this week in Nature Online, the scientific journal, that has now shown that when, as they're starting to do genomic studies of schizophrenia, there are over 600 genes that are different among people with schizophrenia than people who don't have it. That's a puzzle, all right? Not a problem. I think that's where we have to start thinking about what do we do here as we think about communities, marketing, and technologies. So my first question for you, just to kind of get a sense of things, is what are some of the puzzles that you're bringing to us today? Anybody? Is everybody is? Go ahead. Obesity. Obesity. A wonderful puzzle. Trying to make uh, Meals on Wheels more acceptable to older people for the future generations. Terrific, okay. Other puzzles? I got on the left side of it. Is that the sort of the warm side over here? <laughs> <laughs> See the sun shining in? All kinds of environmental issues related to waste water and energy Okay. And green tourism and ecotourism? Green one, green ecotourism. Alcohol. Alcohol, okay. Disability is an equality issue. Terrific, I guess. Yeah, old school economics, for profit business versus modern uh, philosophies on value creation as long term profit. Okay, direct point. Yep. Yeah. And trying to get people outside of the health sector to think about their role in, in health and actually working together rather than in like in silos. silos. Yeah. All right. Under my program of resistance. Yes. Wow, okay. I haven't been there for a while, but yeah, that's the interesting one too. <clears throat> you know, half the work they do in antimicrobial resistance is getting the healthcare workers to change their behaviors. Right? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start off uh, with this little story. Uh, it's research that was done by Leslie Snyder, and what she did was a meta analytic review of all the published health communication campaigns that were in the literature up to about 2006. There's over 400 studies, if you add that up, in that literature review. As you can see, it covers everything from fruit and vegetable consumption to HIV prevention campaign, substance abuse, reproductive health, and a variety of other topics. And what she was looking for was what was the Average effect you could ex expect, again, from these well-designed, well-evaluated health communication campaigns, many of which, for those of you who are in those lines of work, you would instantly recognize. So this is the state of the science as of a couple of years ago. And the major finding that she had is that the best run and planned health communication campaigns will show about a 5% change in the target behavior. So if your target behavior is, say, eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day or uh, getting youth to not start using marijuana, if the baseline rate was 50%, at the end of your well-designed and well-run health communication campaign, <clears throat> the net change would be either 55% would be eating more fruits and vegetables or using marijuana, or 45%. Would be doing it. So it's, it's, a, it's a net change of 5%. And so when we think about how do we address problems, a lot of times what we've thought about is how do we do, how do we use health communication and persuasive methodologies to get people to change? And the best science we have says it will happen about 5% of the time. Now, I'm also going to take this moment to also do a little commercial about social marketing because many people think of social marketing as being these mass communication campaigns. And again, if you're doing mass communication campaigns, posters, public service announcements, adverts, public relations events, and so forth, this is what you will expect to have happen. 
That is not going to solve problems. It may be a piece of a puzzle. Remember, we have lots of pieces of puzzles. But it is not going to solve a problem. So what I want to <clears throat> talk with you about this morning is how do we start shifting from thinking about individuals and individual change to the idea of social networks and communities. How we think about social marketing for broad impact and how we think about using social media and mobile technologies to enable community change, which is where I spend a lot of my time uh, these days. So let's just jump into it. The first is that social networks, and the more recent research that's being done around social networks, is really leading me, anyway, among others, to draw the conclusion that the opportunity and constraints for change are really determined by the social network you're in. If you want to think about that puzzle again, what's the, usually the first approach you take to solving a puzzle? You start with the flat edges on the outside, right? I mean, that's the easy part. It's the only part you, you could really make sense of. So if you think about social networks in terms of puzzles and how you go about solving puzzles, social networks can be part of the frame that you use to think about these things. Because most people, when they're changing their diet behaviors, changing the exercise behaviors, changing their green behaviors and so forth, don't do that as an organism. They do that as part of an environment, and they do that as part of peer networks and other kinds of social and professional networks they have. And if we think about the networks that these people are in, it becomes very important then to think about how do we start working with the network people are embedded in. All right. Now, someone should have thought about the word Facebook by now. All right. Because that's the power of the social media and the power of social network sites like Facebook, Twitter, and these other thousands of sites that are up there, is they allow people to create and strengthen social networks and social ties. So as someone who's trying to work at changing behaviors and changing the world, that becomes a very important tool, I think, for us to reach out and engage in these networks in order to influence the individual change. Because this is really what happens in the social networking world. There used to be theories of social networks that said, you know, if we put something on the telly and broadcast it out to all the right people, we will influence change. And what we found at best, that happens 5% of the time. And it's also not the case that simply by focusing on a few key individuals that we will influence large numbers of people. But rather, it's the fact that there's all these different kinds of networks and all these different kinds of interrelationships that people have, and that research in places like Facebook and MySpace and other social networking sites is showing us that how people form opinions about things, how people form attitudes about things, and even how people behave is largely determined by the social networks they're in. Some of you may uh, have seen research about HIV prevention in Southern Africa, which is where I used to do some work. And we discovered there is that the major determinant of HIV prevalence in villages and communities wasn't condom use. It wasn't the number of sexual partners you had, but it was something called concurrent sexual partnerships. How many different people were you having sex work with on a regular, ongoing basis, but perhaps maybe there were two or three relationships you were having simultaneously or concurrently. So you might have a spouse, but you also might have a lover when you're on the road as a trucker, or you might be doing something on the side with another boyfriend. And these types of concurrent sexual relationships are what we're actually enhancing the transmission of HIV. Not simply as, as many people in Western cultures do, where you have one boyfriend or girlfriend, and then you break up, and then you pick up with another, and then you break up, and then you pick up with another. So it's sequential. This concurrency and mapping concurrent sexual relationships in communities was highly predictive of HIV prevalence rate. There have been at least two articles in the New England Journal of Medicine that some of you may know. Um, one looking at the fact that in the Framingham cohort, that smoking prevalence rates decreased most quickly among people who were, among others, who weren't smokers. And that over the course of 20 years, you could see how in the beginning, 
Smokers were the core of most social networks in the 1970s, and by the 1990s, smokers were out on the periphery of social networks. And we've also seen the same thing with obesity. <coughs> that if your close friend of yours becomes overweight, the chances are very, very, very high you will become overweight too, even if that person lives on the other side of the world. Figure that out. <laughs> All right? Because the natural assumption is, well, of course, if I'm associating with that person every day, or they're my next door neighbor, or they're someone I'm working with, of course that will have an influence on my behavior. Well, you've already kind of gotten into the network idea already. But the fascinating thing about this research of Christophus and Fowler was, even if people had moved to the other side of the United States, if their friend became overweight, somehow, over all those miles, they became overweight. So if you're working in the obesity area, one of, and this is a slightly tongue-in-cheek, one of the things I'd be worried about is Facebook is a transmission <laughs> network for obesity, because it's keeping those people even closer together so they can really share how much they're eating and fearing their weight gain. So one of the things I'm going to suggest you think about as part of this puzzle that you have is to think about how do we use social marketing. And social marketing brings together the promotion, the communication piece, that 5% solution that I was just talking about, but it also adds some other elements to the mix. It adds this idea of products and also services. It adds this idea of prices or incentives and it adds this idea of places or opportunities. And if you will, it gives us another couple pieces to play with in order to solve these puzzles that we're struggling with. The way I talk about social marketing really comes down to these six essential elements. The first thing is, is we are intensely focused on people. It's a very people-centered approach, audience-driven approach. There's lots of words they use to describe it. But the notion is the people who we're serving are the people who we think about first. Not our bosses, not the policy, not what we think would be the right thing to do. But we focus on their wants and needs, their aspirations and dreams, their lifestyle, and also preserving this idea of dignity of choice. Social marketing is not propaganda, persuasion, um, and tying people up that they can only do one thing. It really uh, represents this idea that there are choices in the environment, and sometimes our job as marketers is to actually increase the amount of choices that people have. The second thing about social marketing is that we focus on aggregated behavior change. I am not concerned as a social marketer about changing the behavior of a patient, for instance, who's seeing a doctor because they're overweight. That's health education, that's a whole other set of skills that go into that kind of process. What I'm interested in is trying to get hundreds, thousands, of millions of people to start losing a little bit of weight. If you will, I'm the public health model of communications. So I'm trying to identify priority segments of the population. Who are the people most in need? Who are the people ready to change? Who are the people who are going to be critical to the success of solving my puzzle? And then focusing my program on those people first. So if you will, it's a way of prioritizing different parts of the population, if you will, different parts of the puzzle. If any of you have tried to solve a puzzle, once you've got that frame put together, you have to kind of start working in one area, and it's like, oh, these pieces all seem to be working together, and you get focused in on that for a while. That's the idea. And then you move to another set of populations, and then you move around the whole frame, the whole puzzle, with this marketing approach. Designing behaviors, asking people to do things that fit their reality, that are compatible with their lifestyle. And this is something we're notoriously bad at in public health. All right? Thou shalt eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Thou shalt not smoke. Thou shalt not have unprotected sex. Thou shalt not throw out the wrong paper to the wrong receptacles. All right? There's all these things that we just, well, of course, it's the right thing to do. 
But again, coming from our perspective, not from the audience perspective. And so what the marketing approach is saying is, look, flip that around and understand people's lives first before you start talking about what behaviors they should or shouldn't do. In five-a-day programs, when I first got involved in designing those programs, we discovered most people in the U.S. were eating three servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So rather than talking about five, we talked about two. <coughs> Simply add two. And it sounds like a much more doable behavior to a lot of people, rather than this momentous five, which sends people running out of focus groups screaming um, and looking for something completely unfruit and vegetable-like to eat. <laughs> And this becomes, again, part of that first, first cue. The second thing we do is we look at that price variable that I mentioned and think about it in terms of how do we rebalance or realign incentives and costs for maintaining or changing behaviors. Because people are doing things for lots of different reasons. And a lot of people get focused on, well, what are the barriers to change? Now, I'm one of the people who think about, and as a marketer, think about what are the incentives for change? So I think oftentimes if you can provide people with incentives to do the right thing, they will figure out how to jump, leap, run around the barriers. Uh, and we spend a lot of energy getting involved with barriers that maybe aren't so important, rather than focusing on how do we make these types of things that we're encouraging people to do have more relative advantage and less risk than what they currently do. So again, so how do we fit these things into people's lives and make them beneficial, provide value to them, if you will? And then especially in social marketing, which focuses a lot on behavior and trying to get people to adopt new types of behaviors, how do we create the opportunities and how do we give people access to try, practice, and sustain these things? Or simply trialability. If people do not believe they can engage in the behavior, if people do not believe that that behavior will have positive consequences for them, they're not going to do it. And a lot of times we just basically tell people, just jump off the cliff, eat five servings of fruits and vegetables, you'll be fine. And that's not what most people want to hear. They want to hear, where are all the places I can take low-risk opportunities to try this at first and see if I like it at first before I make a major commitment to it. Because, you know, if nothing else, I have to see, well, what will my friends say when I start doing this, right? Anybody who's ever tried to go on a diet or exercise or do a lot of other kinds of lifestyle changes, you know, what your friends say about it becomes pretty important for those first couple days and weeks and maybe even months. You know, quit smoking and then go to the pub. Quit drinking. Quit drinking and go to the pub. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's just lots of things that go on that you say, okay, yeah, I get it, Doc, but as soon as you go out there into the real world, there's a lot of other things happening that you've got to test first. <laughs> and again, how do we use communication not so much as a persuasive technique, but how do we communicate about the behaviors and about the incentives and about these opportunities so that people realize that they're there? Many times when you look at commercial advertising <coughs> and all their campaigns, it's not so much that they're persuading you to buy a product as it is telling you about all the wonderful things that are exactly what you're looking for at the right price and are really easy to get to and really easy to find really easy to purchase and consume. And that's how marketers think about behavior change in social marketing. So I'm going to leave you with this uh, source, uh, which is in the first issue, the inaugural issue of the Journal of Social Marketing. And uh, I can't give it to you right now, but you can actually get free access to this journal for the next two months. And this model kind of puts together a lot of these different ideas into one little chart. Um, but the point here is that the core of our approach isn't just the audience, but the core of the approach is what does the audience see as the benefit for engaging in the behavior? 
because people who are changing behaviors are not doing it necessarily because they want to live longer lives. Sick people change their behaviors in order to live longer lives, but healthy people aren't usually thinking that way, and young people especially aren't thinking that way. You know, most people aren't changing environmental behaviors in order to save the planet. They're doing it for other, more personally relevant reasons. And we need to understand what the key benefit is from their perspective rather than from our perspective. And that can be the hardest part of a marketing program is the research and the exploration to do that. <coughs> we then look at the determinants, the context, and the consequences of the behavior that we're trying to get people to adopt or to stop doing or to continue doing in spite of all the secular trends that are encouraging them or their peers who are encouraging them to engage in other higher risk behaviors. And then we also have these ideas around brand and positioning that we use quite a bit. The notion here, in essence, is that there's lots of behaviors in the marketplace that people can do. It's a very competitive environment. What do I do now? And if you don't understand why is eating two fruits and vegetables, what's that going to take away from? Because people are not walking around with gaps in their lives, these holes in their lives that you can go, okay, right, there's the place to plug in a fruit or vegetable. Right, and there's the other place to plug it in. Or right, here's the place to be more green. Or here's the place to think about getting more involved with our project. They have to figure out how those things are going to get integrated into their lives. And something's going to have to give. Right? Something's going to have to give. Just like when you're in the grocery store making a decision, do I purchase this or do I purchase that? We all have time as our currency, and there are only 24 hours in a day. So you either sleep a little less and do a little bit more, which you can also do, or you have to figure out you know, what are the trade-offs. And then finally, we've kind of been through the marketing mix a little bit. Uh, BPS is just behaviors, products, and services. That's what we think about first. The prices, the places, and the promotion but that will be a handy resource for you to leave with. I want to jump into the new technologies, and I have until timekeeper. Whenever I want to. Oh, wow. Well, let me slow down. <laughs> this this uh, social media and mobile technology world, you know, I was uh, fortunate to be really bored and had some time five or six years ago when this first started happening. And my fascination with this area is because I'm a clinical psychologist by training, so behavior change has always been like part of my, I would say genetic code, but my genetic puzzle anyway. Uh, and so, you know, the very first thing that pops into my head when I see these new technologies is, oh my God, this is big time behavior change technology. Big time behavior change technology. Because I can reach tens of thousands of people and help them learn new ways to do all sorts of things. Because the basic way, some people would argue 80 to 85% of the ways in which people learn new behaviors is by watching other people, by modeling. It's the old social learning theory, Albert Bandura, goes back 50 years now in that research tradition or more. And observational learning or seeing what other people are doing just gets amplified 10 hundred fold when you're on these social media sites, when you're being exposed to all these different influences that are way beyond the geography you used to have. You know, kids used to play with their friends on the same neighborhood, and now kids go online and play with kids around the world on these virtual sites that are out there. Club Disney, Club Penguin, Pablo Hotel, those kinds of places. That's the way these kids are spending a lot of their free time in. The same thing with a cell phone. If I had known when I was doing my community programs back in the 80s that I could have been buzzing people and texting people and reminding them about their smoking, their weight loss, their blood pressure medications and all that, I would have been crazy. I mean, that would have been their bond to be able to bug at people 24 <laughs> hours, seven days a week. <laughs> about things that they want to change. Now, obviously, you know, you do this permission-based 
marketing with these tech with these technologies. But if people say to me, I really want to quit smoking, here's my cell phone number, good luck, buddy, because I'm going to be on you now. Like I couldn't be on you before. Remember, you used to bring them in, have a counseling session, and then send them off for a week and see them again. And they tell you how in the last five days they've had 18 relapses. And well, unfortunately, you know, there's no way to contact you. No way to talk to you about it until they come back to the office and they have been relapsed for five days. Um, so those kinds of technologies and thinking about these things as extenders for behavior change programs is really important. <coughs> because a lot of people look at these technologies and they think, aha, another way to send a message. Right? And I think that's probably the least effective way of doing this. And I'll probably say 5% effective way of doing this. Because there's an old saying that I get um, quoted about now a lot. But when you, when you think about what we do, is that you know, we all have messages we want to send to people. And what we forget is that most people have lives. They're not interested in messages. There is no market for messages. Right. But there is a market to help people find ways of solving problems in their daily lives. And that's what we need to do. And these, and these cell phone technologies, wireless technologies in particular, I think are just going to be some really unique ways now and certainly into the future to have on-demand solutions to our problems. And if you're not on those technologies with your puzzle and your solutions to the puzzle for people to tap into, you're going to miss the boat. <coughs> Because what is happening to the people who we serve out there is they are creating their own environments <coughs> of media. It's no longer sitting in front of a telly or turning on a radio and listening to these broadcast channels that lots of people are exposed to. People now customize their media. They customize the social network sites they use, the groups they belong to, even where they get their news from. And someone else said it just at the uh, social marketing conference in Dublin this week, uh, which now makes two of us. But Twitter is my major source of news, of professional news, because all the guys who I follow who are in my network, we all send articles and posts and links to different things to each other. And I learn more things faster that way than I would if I was perusing journals and going through the table of contents every week with things. So the fact is we have to figure out ways of not how do we beam messages out to people, but we have to figure out ways of how do we attract people to our issues and our causes, get them involved in our puzzles. Because we simply can't yell at them, cajole them, or entice them in the old ways of uh, media use. People who are in this new media world want to be active, want to be engaged, and it's up to us to figure out how we start doing that. And the point that I always remind people about with the internet, and it's also true with the mobile technologies as well, is that people do not go on the internet to look for information. That's what we do. Right? Most people, believe it or not, are not Google searching, even though you see those big numbers about how many searches are done. Most people are not doing those searches. Students are doing those searches. Academicians are doing those searches. People with problems are doing those searches. Most people, most of the time, are on the internet to tap into their social networks. They're sending emails to each other. They're on Facebook sending messages to each other. They're out there to socialize, not to learn, not to be, and certainly not to change. Right? I have lots of people who come up to me and are asking me, okay, well, we want to do a social media campaign to change X behavior. And we're going to use Facebook to do it. And, and this image usually works pretty well for them. So why don't you try this yourselves? Imagine you're at a cocktail party or reception, large cocktail party reception, with some of your friends. A lot of these people you don't know, but you're there with your kind of circle, maybe say eight or ten friends. <coughs> and you're sitting around chatting and you're having very pleasant times, sipping a little wine, and everything's very nice. And all of a sudden someone comes up and taps you on the show and says, hey, will you stop smoking? <laughs> <laughs> or will you stop drinking? Or will you come over here and help me kind of clean up the planet? <laughs> what? <laughs> 
But that's how people are thinking about using Facebook. Let's go in where people are interacting and chatting with each other and say, hey, wait a minute, no, we want you to change something. We want you to kind of, you know, it's my agenda now. And that, you know, and that kind of approach really needs to be reconsidered. You know, if someone comes up to you at a cocktail bar and says, hi, my name's Craig, and how are you doing, and this is a lovely party, and blah, 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 and what do you do, and blah, 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 and then G and I noticed you were smoking, and have you ever thought about quitting? Kind of different. Over the course of 5, 10, 15, or a thought. Right? Could use many more other examples, but we'll stick with that one for now. Um, that's the kind of stuff that we need to think about. <coughs> as marketers and as people who want to use these new technologies to engage people in our issues and engage people to change. Right? It's a completely different conversational style you need to have, which is why most government agencies and many bureaucratic agencies hate the idea of using this stuff. You know, since this all began six years ago, till probably three weeks ago, you know, the number one question I get is, well, we want to set up a blog on our website, how do we turn off the comments? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't want to, you know, it's like we don't want to hear this stuff. We don't want to, have, which is kind of a really interesting point of view. All right. All right, we want to go use the social technology and we don't want to hear what anybody has to say. All right. And they say it with a straight face. You know, that's the money thing. And there's probably half the people in this room who have said that at some point, or at least have heard it too. And you said, you know, so why use the technology if you're not willing to change your behavior? Because that's what this whole social media space is about. It's as much as how we have to change our behavior, we have to move from this persuasive communication approach that we've used for these health communication campaigns where we create a message, we package it up very creatively and very nicely, and we inject it into people and we wait to see what happens. <clears throat> Did we cure mercy? And we do that same, we think with social media, we can do the same thing. If we just make the message attractive, and with Twitter, we can keep it down to 140 characters. You know, if we make it just right, we will get people to change behavior. And that may work a little bit of the time, and it may be a little piece of the puzzle. But in a larger social media space, what we're finding is that is not what's going to work. Because Web 2.0, as some people call it, is all about community. And when you're listening and talking more today about communities in the real world, in the social media space, those same principles apply. People go online to make things happen. I mean, you just have to look at what's been going on in the Middle East for the last few months to understand that, yes, social media had a place to play when it came to how do you organize people against governments. I don't think it led to the overthrows, and it wasn't the determining, but it certainly helped people create communities. It helped people communicate among social networks to make things happen. People weren't isolated from each other anymore. That's the power of these technologies. And when you go online and look, I think the, the one number that I have, I think there's over 500,000 websites and communities online for different types of diseases and conditions and behavioral problems, from drug abuse prevention and you know, Alcoholics Anonymous to you know, parents, with, parents of children with very special and rare disorders are all getting online because they're all talking, they're all sharing information with each other. And that's the place we need to go to get connected. Many, many communities have lots of, lots of sites set up around you know, neighborhood safety, com safety communities and safe watch programs. Um, you'll find all types of resources already there. You don't have to create them, you have to join them. And against the idea of walking up to people who are already at the party and talking with them rather than say, hey, I'm here, come over to my end of the room and start talking to me because I'm the important person now. I've got the money or I've got the mandate to talk to you about these things. So social media allows us to do a lot of things. 
you know, when you talk about collaboration, community coalitions, and other types of work, doing that online solves lots of problems. Some research that's been done with community coalitions, for example, finds that 20% of the time and effort that is spent on coalition work is spent traveling to and from the meetings. So why can't we just go online and have some of these meetings online? You know, I, I, I've said that in a few places, and the light bulbs go up and say, oh my God, rather than having to travel all these people from all ends of the country or all ends of the state, we could just get online every month and then just have quarterly meetings. And everyone would save, mon you know, save money, they wouldn't be away for as long, and oh, by the way, they'd probably get more done. That to me is like a, you know, a perfect use of that for, for the community building. Harnessing collective intelligence. You know, rather than, you know, you know, we all know, you know, so and so is going to leave, and so we're going to lose all that history. Well, not necessarily. I mean, you can now collect those things online and put those things into wikis and the blogs and other types of platforms so that it lives beyond the people. And people can share information a lot more quickly, too. I mean, how many times 10 years ago did you say, geez, I wish I had that report. Oh, I'll send you one. You know, you should get it in two weeks. Oh, here's the URL. You can download it now. All right? Those types of um, intelligence operations are just more and more important, especially when you're dealing with complicated problems. Everyone becomes a content creator, so everyone can contribute. That's particularly important because that whole philosophy in social media takes on a life of its own. What we talk about in that space now is we talk about the people formerly known as the audience. And I was talking in Dublin and I said, audience is a word that no one should be allowed to use anymore in this space. You know, people talk about producers, they talk about prosumers, they have all these, you know, fancy little words that I guess gets them a couple inches on their blog. Um, but the notion is that people are actively engaged in creating content and uploading it to YouTube, posting on their own blog sites, putting pictures up on Flickr and other kinds of photo sharing sites. But the, um, <coughs> the feeling is, is that I want to be engaged with you. I don't just want to hear what you have to say to me. So you hear more and more about co-creation from lots of different perspectives. But in the social media perspective and in the marketing perspective, co-creation means we're no longer dragging people into a focus group, talking at them for a few minutes, and asking them some questions, and sending them on their way saying thank you very much. Wait for our project. Co-creation means you can bring people in all through the process. And the creative people I work with get really scared because they say, you mean you actually let them create the ad too? And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, they may not be the best artists and we'll need someone to clean it up. But why not have people being part of this process all the way through rather than just what we have usually done, which is kind of, you know, hit them at the beginning, maybe hit them in the middle, and then go out and give them a service at the end. There's no need to do that anymore. And when you're working in this social media space, their expectation is that they can be involved and regularly involved, which makes it for a much more dynamic <coughs> process, I think a much more interesting process, and probably a much more valuable process, because then we get a chance to learn from them as much as they get a chance to learn from us. And that whole attitude, I think, is part of what's changing in a lot of fields as we go further into these social puzzles that we're working with. Obviously, you have greater access to knowledge and information. You know, a lot of community sites that we set up, a lot of which we set up are just, you know, thousands of articles and posts go up so that people can constantly be accessing different kinds of resources. And the nice thing is that when you set this up for your community, your community becomes the curator for these projects, for this information. And they can actually say, here's the most important stuff you should read, as opposed to simply, here's all the stuff. You should read, which is what government is <laughs> And it encourages the, this idea of media multiplexity. Multiplexity being the notion is that you're being exposed to lots of different media sources and lots of different channels. 
rather than simply relying on just a few. You know, what we find as we do research with, with people who are using mobile technologies and social media is they don't stop watching television and they don't stop listening to the radio. They don't stop going to movie theaters. They just have added more into the mix. And for us, as people who are trying to work with them, that means that there's more different ways we need to reach out and engage with them. Because it's not 50% of my time is spent in front of the tube anymore. It may be 30% of my time, and the other 20% is online, or in some cases, maybe as much as 70% of my time is online. And of course, the other thing it does is it expands and manages social networks. And any of you who have been, who have really gotten engaged and involved with, say, a Facebook or a MySpace or any other kind of social network, sorry, LinkedIn, it's amazing how many connections you can start making if you start following through. You know, people I know who know other people who know other people. Um, you know, it's, we call it the Kevin Bacon effect. People know Kevin Bacon, the actor. Well, there's a game that you play that almost any actor you can name is probably related to Kevin Bacon within six degrees of separation. Some of you may know six degrees of separation as well. But that idea is that you know if I pick any name randomly off of the planet and any name randomly in this room, within six connections, you will probably be able to connect me to any person in the world. Someone you know, who knows somebody else, who knows somebody else, who knows somebody else, who knows that villager in southeastern South. <coughs> I mean, it's a, and these people who do that kind of research do it all the time and just come up with these stunning discoveries like that. Facebook, LinkedIn can be the same kind of thing. You know, when I want to find out who, to, how can I get into the White House and talk to somebody about social media, it was stunning in LinkedIn that I was like two connections away. You know? How do you, you know, and you simply make those connections and keep going. When you're thinking about how do we expand our community coalitions, how do we bring other people into the fold from outside of traditional health sources, sometimes it's tapping into those networks that they have online and bringing those online networks together as well. Because it's easier to spend time online than it is to pack up, get in the car, drive to your meeting, get back to my office, get back to what I was supposed to be doing. All right, and if you think of time as being the big energy saver, uh, these things make a lot of sense. So while many people think about social media as a way of how do we get other people to change, I like to think about social media as how does it help us to change how we do our work, how we go about solving these puzzles that we have. And a lot of it's through these kind of networking ideas of how do we enhance the existing linkages we have? How do we strengthen these things? So rather than having a coalition meeting every month, maybe we can have an online coalition check-in every week. You know, Skype conference calls, I'm you know, just stunned how many people now talk about doing Skype and these all inexpensive conference calls over the internet. Whereas three or four years ago, it seemed like there was just a few hundred thousand of us who were doing that. Developing new relationships, Enabling indigenous helpers, you know, a lot of people use volunteers, community workers, and other types of paraprofessionals to do work for them. What we do in developing countries is we do a lot of mobile technology that enables community workers to actually do diagnosis and treatment right there when they're with the patient, rather than taking down all their clinical notes, you know, coming back to the office, you know, probably maybe in two days in some cases because of the distances involved having someone review them and saying, oh right, next time you're out there, you know, give them this. And um, you know, and a week later, that person is finally being treated, as opposed to just texting in the information or taking a photo and sending it in right there on the spot. And having a clinician being able to look at that over the uh, wireless system and send instructions right back through an SMS uh, to say, you know, 60 milligrams or you know, two blue tablets and be treating things much more quickly and effectively. It also allows people to collect data, transmit data back, a lot of surveys are now going to mobile technology, so there's lots of different things to be thinking about here. Creating new networks, weaving together networks, when you're trying to do these intersectoral programs that never seem to work, perhaps these new technologies are going to allow us to kind of solve some of that puzzle as well. How do we get people working from different sectors?
together. Maybe it doesn't meet physically in the same room in order to make some of those things happen. Okay, and finally, uh, moving into the mobile technology space for a couple of minutes, and then I'll be wrapping up. Uh, in, case, yeah, in case you didn't know, uh, it's no longer about cigarettes. But mobile is a philosophy, and, and I could tell lots of different stories about mobile programs, but uh, for right now, um, yeah, what, what I'd like to get thinking about is, is strategically, how do I think about a mobile phone? And a mobile phone is not a way of sending a message to somebody. Yes, it can do that, but don't stop there. Because what a lot of us are thinking about who are in the uh, big space, and Alan Moore, this is, some, this is a paper he did for uh, Microsoft, is also getting serious in the mobile space, is we're thinking about these big ideas. Mobile is going to become the way to simplify your life. Everything you need to have is going to be on your mobile phone. Already, you know, we know that when you walk out the door in the morning, there's three things you check for before you close the door. Right. You look for your wallet, you look for your car keys, and you look for your phone. And okay, and your glasses. <laughs> That's a segment of the population, but a growing segment of the population. Who is doing that as well? I certainly do that. <laughs> Never have walked off without my glasses, but the phone once in a while. But this whole idea of life navigators, when you're walking around and trying to figure out what to do, having your cell phone, whether it's pulling up a map, whether it's quickly getting a question answered, you know. I'm not sure, I think the Guinness World Book of Records is starting to decline in sales because now people can settle those bar bets by just doing it on the phones right there at the bar um, and just looking things up. You know, people who, are, people who have diseases or are having symptoms, they're all sitting there putting things into their phone and trying to figure out what's going on with them. Uh, there's literally, you know, tens of thousands of applications hundreds of thousands of applications you can get for an iPhone or for an Android phone. All those things are about becoming life navigators and also this concept of life enablers. <coughs> who, know you could, who knew you couldn't live without angry birds? Right? One of the apps. Uh, you know, but you put some of these things on your phones and it's like, you know, who knew that you couldn't live without having email here? rather than plugged into a wall with a big screen in front of it. Who knew that you could take a picture and send it immediately to friends or parents? I mean, I was at a baseball game, you know, the spring season just started in the U.S. And, you know, there were people, you know, at the stadium, beautiful day, taking pictures and so taking pictures of a, you know, five-year-old at his first baseball game and sending it to grandpa and then getting on the phone and talking about, yeah, here we are at the game. Yeah, it looks really good and it looks like a really nice day, blah, blah. I mean, this co-presence idea that you can be sharing experiences with each other across the world through just something in your hand is an amazing technology, but also an amazing tool, I think, for helping to solve puzzles. If we think about it as helping to solve a puzzle and not just the way of talking or texting people. So I think there's a, I was busy yesterday. <laughs> there's lots of things going on out there, and I think one of the things with marketing, I think one of the things with these new technologies, it really gives people an opportunity to achieve a lot more equity in access, a lot more equity in prices, a lot more equity in the types of behaviors we're able to practice, because a lot of people, you know, we talk about practicing some of these behaviors as if everybody should be able to do that. And in fact, they can be very difficult things to do. Just in a conversation on the way over here on our Wednesday, we were talking about breastfeeding programs. And you know, people now, you know, the public health people want women to breastfeed for at least a year. And uh, the marketing person I was talking with, you know, noted that, you know, that's kind of like asking everyone to drive a Mercedes Benz. And, you know, it may be the gold standard, but it's a very difficult thing for most people to do. They don't have a lot of the resources it takes to do that, not just financial. Uh, but all the different things that have to fall into place, that, that puzzle of breastfeeding for a year is a lot more complicated than just do it and stick to it. 
but yet we kind of create these programs that, that are, act as if that's just the problem, is you need to just be more motivated to do it. You need more reinforcement to do it. So creating this kind of equality across groups of people and, and across different kinds of opportunities and behaviors are important. So kind of as a take home, this little table I think hits a lot of points that I've made uh, in this morning. Uh, and it really is that when you think about how do we move from a marketing conversation, a new technology, social media conversation, from what we've traditionally done, which is in the right hand here, where we used to transmit, preach, command and control, turn off comments, formal and instructive, and tell your audience type of mentality of communication, that we really need to think about how do we focus on engaging and participating with people, co-creating with people, advocating, and letting people become advocates for our causes. I think the missed opportunity we, all, we often have <coughs> is that we don't allow people to kind of take up the message for us. They all get, you know, people get concerned, well, what if they mess it up? Well, you know what? They were already messing it up. New technology did not all of a sudden get people to start talking about your programs. You know, new technology just gives you a way of tracking what they're talking about. But you know, people, the most important way to influence someone is through an interpersonal communication channel, word of mouth. And social media and mobile technologies are the ultimate word of mouth change channel. So let them become your advocates. And I always, every program I work with now has to have a component, and I look for a component that says, when do we let these people we used to call an audience become the advocates for the cause, rather than just the doers or the receivers of the cause? Inform and collaborate, an informal and conversational st style, and also the whole sense you've got to be thinking about building communities and building networks. That is just part of the ethos you have to have when you're moving into the space in order to be really successful. And there's not a lot of examples of this in the public health and the environmental change worlds so much as there are in the corporate sector. Because I spend some of my time and a lot of my buddies in the corporate sector, we learn a lot of lessons from what not to do, from what they do. Uh, and every time you see one of these great blow-ups in the newspapers about a corporation who has kind of blown their Facebook or their social media story, you can just go down this checklist and these words are usually <coughs> off. They weren't doing these things and they weren't being responsive, and they weren't being timely. Okay, everybody got this for now? Okay, I saw a lot of scribbling stars. So to close up, you know, what do we want to think about when we're designing interventions using marketing communities and, and new communications for behavior change? Uh, it's do we harness the ability to educate people about issues and problems that are relevant to them? Not us. Okay, and that's not to say that, well, my issue is fruits and vegetables, but you, you know, their issue is uh, pollution. So I should not talk about fruits and vegetables anymore, I should talk about pollution. What it means is I should be thinking of ways of talking about fruits and vegetables and ways that relate to their concerns about pollution and sustainable agriculture. And there will be another group of people who will be thinking about something from you know, else. And that will be a different segment of my population, and now I need to talk about fruits and vegetables in a different way to them. And it's going to be by identifying these different lives that people have that, uh, that I can start fashioning a program that becomes relevant and meaningful and more effective to them. I can start solving the puzzle from their point of view as well. What, how do we engage them in positive and meaningful ways? Is there an entertainment value to our offer? You know, do people, and entertainment is really a way of engaging people in our cause. It's not, you know, can we make them laugh, can we make them cry? It's, you know, can we get them to the point of being very curious and passionate about the same things that we are? Do people believe and feel empowered as a result of their experiences with our programs, products, and services? And last, we take advantage of every opportunity to let them become our evangelists. To kind of let go of the message and let them take it further into their networks. Because that, again, is the whole conceptual idea and, and reality behind what's going on with these new technologies. These people are connected with hundreds of other people who you will never see or touch, but they can. Um, so think about that as you're doing these things. 
So none of the stuff that I've said here do I want you to think is kind of the US born or Canadian born or the North American born. Uh, you need to take these ideas and make them your own. And when I was in the shop, I couldn't resist taking a picture of one of these posters because I think it really kind of from a design point of view and design thinking point of view really talks and captures a lot of what we all need to be doing in our own particular parts of our world. And that's imagining and designing and making programs for us where we live, for the people who we're serving. So with that, I thank you very much. I have to put my plug in that the, um, there's a book coming out, which is a selected reading from my blog. If you haven't been on it before, socialmarketing.blogs.com has lots of information about things like this to go on all the time, not as frequently these days as I used to, but still in the social, mobile, and uh, marketing space. Uh, I'm told by others who read it over 3,000 a day that it's a pretty interesting place to get some ideas from. So hopefully you can enjoy that as well. And if you want more information about the book, I'll leave that behind as well. So with that, thank you very much, and I will... Yeah, something that comes to mind there is, in building communities, is the emotional input that you have to put in to build a community. And us as public organizations, we're very bad at that. We're very bad at the emotional side of the campaign and stuff like that. And, and I'd just be interested in your feedback on that. How, how, how do you build that? Because if you're going to build a, com a community of any sort, you want to have some sort of emotional content. Why? Hey, if, if you agree with that point, and I do, I think it becomes very important to kind of find, find people who are going to be your heart and your soul of your program. And sometimes the uh, person from the government agency isn't going to be that for any variety of reasons. Uh, but I think understanding that you need to have that needs to be part of how, how do you think about putting together your coalition? And I know I have always kind of done this, maybe in the back of my mind sometimes rather than the forefront. But saying who's going to be my um, yeah who's going to be my emotional heart and soul who's going to be my my spark plug who's going to be the person who's going to ride around this and oftentimes it's someone from the community it is not you know the official coalition agency members where where that passion comes from but I think it's important to find that and really rally around that because I think having an intellectual leader, having an emotional leader, having strategic leaders, all those different roles need to go into it. And I think because you've identified that, that's the strength of what you're doing. Because I think if you don't have that kind of asset built into your coalition, you're always going to be, um, you know, the quote I was using again, this stuff all kind of fits together at some point, um, is that you know emotions are what lead to change and, and reasons or rationality is what leads to excuses. Because right? you can rationalize all these things, but it's the emotional commitment to the issue that actually leads to the change that people experience, whether it's personally or whether it's in these uh, groups and community coalitions. So I think when you're thinking, what are the roles that I should have in a coalition? Who's the heart? Who's the soul? And almost every coalition I can ever think about that was successful we always knew exactly who that person was. I mean, even when we create project teams, and I'm working with a couple organizations now around project teams, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about, we talk about the head, we talk about the arms, we talk about the legs, but we also talk about, okay, who's gonna be the heart of this project? Uh, so we really know where those feelings are reside to, instead of just cutting them off from the rest of the experience. Because most people in the real world, that's who they're gonna connect with, and that's who you wanna get out in front of. I think you saw, uh, I can't remember the name, but the uh, guy who followed me at the plenary session, the African yes. physician we had, who, uh, who I met five years ago, who was just one of these guys, very plain, very simple, but when you listen to him talk, he just, he just whatever he says, I'm going to do that, because that's just the kind of guy he is. And, you know, they'll say, I'm not a social marketer, but, you know, in, you know, natively, he has lots of social marketing smarts, and so when he gets people organized together, they just go off and follow him wherever he is headed. 
Uh, Andrew Murphy is my name. I'm sorry, I'm going to reduce things to the banal and that Amsterdam is an evaluation of programs and there's a research submission date coming up. Okay. So, and, I mean, as you outlined, the interventions can be so powerful. How can you, uh, and I come from the medical paradigm, so randomized trials are what would be traditionally looked at. How can you have control groups when you're unable to control uh, the intervention to the extent that you don't know what, where influence is happening? Um, does that mean that the standard randomized trial is going to be in trouble for trying to look at, at evaluation of interventions like this? Well, I mean, in some circles, the randomized clinical trials are already in trouble. <laughs> I don't know that that is clearly, yeah. but I'm just coming from a paradigm that yeah. you try and justify um, resource allocation to something like yeah. this. I, again, you know, the RCT design is meant to solve the problem and identify those individual components that we can then say are you know, the dependent variables. And I think that there's going to be new types of designs. I mean, the whole part of this whole social network uh, approach is a whole series of social network designs and social network analysis and social network experimental methods that, frankly, everyone's trying to sort out how are these things going to work in this new paradigm. So I don't have a simple answer for you on that point. I think you know what I'm suggesting to more people is that you look to do these case control comparisons and you look to do these quasi-experimental designs where you can at least control a few of the contextual variables that are going on, but certainly not be able to get it into these tightly formulated uh, approaches like you used to. There are still people, you know, there are people running around creating RCTs around mobile technology right now, and they're probably going to be more or less successful in doing that. Uh, but I think moving forward, just encouraging people to look at some of the other kind of the social network designs that are out there and ways of doing social network analysis are hopefully a, a way for the future because I'm starting to talk now about how you look at patterns of change rather than single point uh, changes um, as a way of uh, getting a handle on what these complicated problems have to deal with. I mean, the, the RCTs play a very important role to, to solve and look at some problems, but I think in some of this social space, if there are limitations come up pretty quickly like you're identifying. Okay. So, We'll take one more, because I know Craig has said he'll stay for coffee, so um, I, I know we're Irish and we're bad on time, but I don't want to be disastrous, so I'll take one more question. And, um, I'm just going to be interested in, in any case studies of trying to change policy makers using social media, where in green tourism, eco tourism, <coughs> the problem is not on the ground changing the people, it's changing the policy makers. Actually, there are lots of case studies around that. One of the sites <coughs> that you should go look at for those type of things, there's a site called mobilechange.org. And mobilechange.org is a really nice site. It, it's aimed at volunteers, nonprofit, non-governmental groups. And it's all about how do we use technologies to advance political advocacy programs of all time. The best case study is you may remember there used to be a president in the Philippines called Aquino. Well, he was overthrown by mobile smartphones. Long before all this stuff happened in the in the Middle East, they were doing it in the Philippines with with uh, with, with uh, mobile phones to do these work. And and you'll also see how do you get people engaged in, in online uh, petitioning and other types of processes that are aimed upstream at the policymakers. Uh, a lot of good a lot of good case studies there. So I would start there for some. I have no doubt um, that you agree with me that we have been extremely fortunate. Fortunate that Craig came to Dublin for the World Conference, but fortunate as well that Galway has stolen a little bit of his heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that he has taken the time out. You can imagine the demands on his time, because he deals with policymakers not just in America, but around the world. So we're very privileged, we're very honored, and we're extremely grateful to have had you come on this visit to Galway, and hope now that we've stolen a little bit of your heart to come back. Yes. And to entice that even Oops. further, Oops. we have a maid in <coughs> Galway present for well, As long as it's made in Galway. Then. Made in Galway, Galway maid, Galway crystal. And it's wrapped for traveling as well. So we've been thinking about behavior, which is a bit heavy. Okay. And the stuff that goes in it, you will have to take care of that yourself. Being okay. such a market, we're not buying any alcohol here. Okay. We have a very green room. Um, thank well, you thank you very much. much.